Okay. Thank you, Wendy, for an absolutely fascinating lecture. I'm sure that's generated a whole host of questions. So I'd like to open up the floor for questions, but could I ask you to wait for the roving mic to get to you so we can actually make sure the question is properly recorded? So who has a question? Okay, the back there. Excuse the mic. Excuse yes, me. Thank, thank you. How important is, uh, do you think, was your introduction to computing through maths? Because you started with maths well, as a foundation. There was no computing. When I went to university, there were no computer science courses, so it wasn't an option. I'm not sure I would have done it as a degree. I'm saying that. Um, I don't know. Um, I absolutely adore. I... I, I um, I think because of the nature of computer science courses, I really think this is why you don't get, we don't get so many women on them. There are a lot of women that love coding, but a lot, our courses are very, very... I remember, who was it at Stanford? The famous lecturer at Stanford, Eric Roberts, said something like, you know, we do extreme coding. I think, well, I'm not into... You know, I'm just, <laughs> that's not the world I want to be in. I want to be in a world where... We are exploring this technology. I need to know how it works. I need to get involved in building things. But I want to, I want to work with how people use them. I mean, when you think about, you know, the, the, we got HCI into the curriculum, but it's like one course, usually. It should be, um, um, I see John sitting at the back there is an expert in this area. That, that there may be courses around that are much more, um, uh, uh, what's the word, it, 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 about people. In computer, and, and I think we could build them. I think we can. Uh, but until we do that, I don't think we'll get that many women wanting to study computing. I really don't. And I say that, not, hmm. I, I, it's just my thoughts. Um, if I was, I would love to do a degree in web science. Um, and I suppose I've ended up designing a program that I would, it's sort of my ideal type of degree because our web science students learn a lot about the technology. It's not the whole of computing, but it, they learn a lot about the technology. They learn to program through the web world, in the web world, and, uh, but they also learn a lot about people as well um, and how all, uh, society works. And um, well, I think that's a course I could have done. But nowadays, of course, people come from computing from lots of different backgrounds. But when I started, there were no computer science courses. And actually, did I say I wanted to be a medic? <laughs> so, you know, my mistress told me um, medicine wasn't a career for women. Oh, that was in 1969. And she was right then, in a sense. And I probably had a better career because of it, because she said, play to your strengths. Well, she didn't use that. She was very prim and proper, Miss Bland. <laughs> and uh, she didn't say play to your strengths, but she said, you're good at maths. Go, go read maths at Cambridge. So I went and read maths, but I didn't apply to Cambridge. I rebelled a little bit. And that was probably a mistake, but anyway, who knows? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. Come here. Mm -hmm. OK, Wendy, the uh, web is um, going a pace, and um, we're, we're sort of um, trying to understand the, the, the big structure. But there's a, still a large number of people there um, who are actually cut off from the web in various ways, and uh, you know, their high street shops are closing, and they can't do the shopping online, and because they don't know how to use the web. And and um, well, there are people where broadband doesn't penetrate, for example, etc. Etc. Et <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, have you got any re re have you got any re <laughs> have you got any remedy for these people <laughs> who are getting left behind because you know the, 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 their local offices of um, the, you know etc. etc. They're, they're all closing eh? and they don't live near enough the library or wherever to get to um, somewhere where they can access the web. Yeah, it's a very very important point, and I don't dismiss it lightly. Um, it is a transition point. <laughs> I think. There will always be people, because there are always accessibility issues in terms of technology, always. Um, but um, there are issues around a generation. I mean, I have a 94-year-old mother who uh, can't, has, you know, she can hardly use a mobile phone, let alone um, uh, explore the sort of technology we're talking about here. And yet I know her life would be hugely enriched. And there is, uh, if she could, uh, she's luckily doesn't have any of these dementia problems. But, um, uh, and I remember once standing behind a lady, a rather elderly lady who could hardly walk in the, in the queue at check-in at British Airways, 
and there was some problem, and they said, oh, you should have done that online. And she said, <laughs> how, do, how do I, I'm not online, I don't have the internet. And the lady behind the desk said, well, go to your library then. And you think, what? <laughs> you know, I, I, I totally get this. And of course, we are still in, a, in a, uh, there's a whole world out there not on the internet as well, and that's part, um, but there's parts of the world that are getting there faster than us because they're getting it through their mobile phones, not going through the landlines. Um, and parts of Africa and India and other remote areas of the world that are getting hold of, getting access to the web through the mobile phone. So that's a major step forward. It is a transition, and I, um, I've always thought that the answer is to get the young to help, if it's an el elderly or people who have accessibility problems, to get the people who can do to help the people who can't, because it is an inevitableness. Companies are moving this way. They have to for efficiency reasons. Um, uh, and uh, to be uh, up with the game. Um, and um, so we need companies to think about ways of doing it, of making it easier for people who don't have access. Um, the broadband thing, well, we just have to, you know, roll, we, need, we actually need better policies about, from I don't know if it's government or government working with the companies to make sure that we do have full broadband throughout the UK at some sort of speed. But um, I think when you, you know, there is a transition thing with people who are just never going to get adapt to the technology, and there has to be. There, are, there is now. I met somebody here. There's a club that has school kids who go out to help people in their house, you know, elderly people in their houses who haven't got access, and and it's that sort of. Volunt I don't know. I mean, I it's we we, we need to think about the. the it's um, I often think what will happen when the baby boomers like me get to the point where there's a new technology comes out and we're cut off from it for what and I think that happens to every generation, doesn't it, to some extent. It's happening more so in that because as you say the shops are closing, the post office are closing, the banks are closing. Real real issue. But it takes some government policy to sort it out. Next question. I don't have a magic Thank answer. You. Hi Wendy, great talk. Um I would like to ask you to perhaps elaborate on what you were saying towards the end about what men can do to help women in tech because I spend, as, as, as you know, those of us who are women in tech activists spend quite a lot of time being women in science and sometimes it kind of cuts in the time you have to actually do science. So um, I like the idea of sort of putting out a clarion call to the men in the room to try and help out with some of this and if you could elaborate on that, that would be great. In my, in my career, I've had to, as I've tried to point out, I've been an acti activist in this area since 19, the 1980s. But I've had to consciously, during my career, pull back in order to further my career. So when I had my EPSRC fellowship, I think I did very little. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I didn't push. I mean, I was asked to talk. I can't. Uh, that I, do. I didn't do any active work in, in the area. But when I, um, uh, when I became president of the BCS, when I was president of the ACM, uh, and at various periods in my life, I got much more active again. I have deliberately chosen at times to focus. And I felt quite, you know, a typical woman thing. I felt selfish about it at the time. <laughs> but I thought it was really important to get on with the science and um, get the you know, get up the top of the ladder so I could try and help other people up and all that sort of stuff. Um, also, I advise, when I'm mentoring uh, younger women in, in the, when they're starting off in their career, a lot of them, they, they, they want to get into this world. They want to be surrounded by more women. And so they, 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 they want to be in this activist uh, mode. And I say, no, hang on. Don't take that responsibility on. Put yourself first, put your career self, particularly if you're going to have a family as well. You know, you've really, really got to be careful about what you do when in your career. Um, but so the bit about, we, it has to be an issue for us all, not owned by women. So uh, I really, I love women's networks, that's what I've been trying to say. I really think they have an important role to play, but I don't want to be spending my time talking about women and computing to women. This is a great audience, it's mixed. Um, I want to hear men talk about women in computing, not in a statistics um, sort of uh, formulaic way, but in a, 
in a passionate way, and I want to see I want to see men kick up a fuss when there's an all male panel and sacrifice their place in a way of saying I'm not going to be on that panel. If you want me on that panel, there's got to be a woman on it. That sort of thing to try and break down this um, this this divide that we have. And a number of times, still, you see. Um, uh, I won't know. A woman sent me a, a list. Of, here's, a here's a list of committees. This is a new committee in uh, cybersecurity or something. It's all men again. You know, and you think, ah, we're just... And, they, and there's no excuse these days because things like... I'm sorry, I'm going on. But things like Computer Week... I think it's Computer Weekly. But um, I always get them up. Brian Glick has the, um, the top tech... The tech 100 or something. And then he... Because there weren't any women on the list, he did the tech 50 women... Um, to highlight the women, and all those women automatically go forward to be vote as part to be in the. the um, you can vote for them as, as well as the men that are in the list. So you highlight women. I'm on the, well, I'm in the power list, the Women's Hour power list, and that's got me all sorts of things, including Desert Islanders. And um, the, and this year I'm in the 100 women to watch on the Forbes list. This is for the non-exec board things and. Whilst they're not saying these are the people you choose from, they're highlighting. This is what the women, this is this is doing, is highlighting successful women to say, look, you can't it say there's uh, the, there's no excuse for saying there aren't any women. It's just that the male networks don't know them. It's like I mean, I know more women than I know men in that sense. And I, when you think of um, you're in, when someone asks you to think of someone to be on a panel, be a keynote, you think of people like yourself. So it's breaking that down. Does that? Help a bit, John. Yes. So I know some names and not others. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Oh, so thank you for that privilege. First of all, Wendy, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. You know, really fitting tribute to Karen in both the content and the performance. And you've raised loads of issues. I was thinking about the fact the reason that you could point on the laser disc was actually we got every school kid in the country, or a kid in every school in the country more accurately, um, to, to highlight objects on the images on the Doomsday Project and backed them up with a, a, a building, literally a building full of editors in Ealing. I would dread to think what it would be like on the web. First crowdsourcing project? Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And that was only 35,000 images, which Google's probably capturing every millisecond. But anyway, um, you know, or, or public disclosure, to your, your, your uh, uh, village, not to, are they meeting their public disclosure requirements? But what I really wanted to ask you was, if you could change one thing in your career, one thing you did, perhaps one thing you didn't do that you wish you had, or one thing you did do you wish you'd taken another path, what would that one thing be? Because you don't really know what you haven't, what you've missed out on because of choices you've taken. What would I have done? Sounds like you got it right. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd have been Dean for the last four years. <laughs> going out live, isn't it? I better be careful. Yeah. And then I finished being dean in July, and uh, I was a bit of a reluctant dean. It was needs must at the time. I took one for the team, I think. <laughs> but that's a la that's a latter one because I um uh you see when I was head of ECS, uh, I wanted to see if I liked management and how if I wanted. I knew I'd be good at it, of course, but I. <laughs> No, I, I wanted to see if that's where I wanted my career to go. Did I want to be a vice chancellor or not? And I did that. That head of ECS, I loved being head of ECS. It's a wonderful uh, department as it was then. Became at the school, and then it's now part of the faculty that I'm dean of. Um, I'm very proud to have been that. And I, but I'd had three years. I signed up for five, and three years I'd had enough. Right? I knew then I thought I'd done a reasonable job, and actually I wanted to get back to the research. That's what I wanted to do. And then we had a fire. And uh, it wasn't a decision, really. It, I don't regret it, but I, I felt I had to stay on and be head of ECS and see the department of school through the terrible two, through two years after the fire. When we so tr and, I, and I don't regret that at all. It's not a regret. But I, um, I do sometimes wonder. We were, well, we still built the web science stuff, though. I mean, that was all happening. We were launching web science. The fire was 2005, and we launched the web science thing in 2006. So I, I, um, I managed to keep going through that. Um, 
that I, I can't think of a major, major regret, possibly doing too many talks about women in computing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, gentleman at the back. Um, there's one thing you could regret. You didn't come to Brunel. You could have done. There was a computer science course. Oh, don't come to Brunel, sorry. <coughs> we did have, and we did have... So you reminded me, <coughs> my headmistress wanted me to go to Oxford. She said, yeah. and I don't know if that's a regret or not. I mean, there's probably plenty of people in this room who have an Oxford degree and, and benefited from it. I don't know whether that was a mistake or not. I really don't know. But and I, I don't think it was, because I've had a fantastic career by going to Southampton. I'm sorry. Yeah. To Brunel, but no, but we, um, been <coughs> we did have women, and one of the women became the student representative on B BCS Council. Okay. <coughs> I think we're working up to drink soon, you. but perhaps one more over there. <coughs> Hello, Wendy. Um, Margaret, uh, that's uh, a lady who used to do <laughs> work education to education. I'm not sure it's about this dementia le thing that you were talking about. And of course, it's the week of friends, of, you know, befriend somebody with dementia. And I don't know enough neuroscience to be able to make any um, judgment, but I value what you think about it. And that is that, that one of the things about dementia is, as you know, that people can't retain lots of information in their brain at the same time and they can't juggle that information. And having, getting older myself, I know lots of people with dementia now who, many of whom were, like me, um, atomic physicists and nuclear physicists and in that field. And sadly, quite a few of them now cannot use the web. It isn't because they didn't they did use the web and they did use email and they did use computing for large scale data analysis but the reason they no longer can use it is because they can't juggle mentally the way in which it works and so I think with the predictions that one in three are going to have dementia and with the predictions that more and more people are living longer I mean, you may have a solution up your sleeve, but I've seen more and more people, when they reach, you know, 75 or so on, actually discontinue. I mean, I sing into opera societies and we all get our midi files, you know, to learn the things. And quite a few of us are not young. <laughs> and gradually, you know, some of them can no longer download the files simply because they can't juggle mentally. I'm doing this because I was on the Longitude Committee and I chaired the Robotics and Smart Devices subcommittee that, and each of the subcommittees was asked to come up with a challenge. And uh, we eventually came up, it started off as robot, robots helping people with disabilities and then it, uh, it went to, um, I can't remember how, I can't remember how the, it, it developed, but we went to the... And it isn't a, it's about smart devices and some robotics to help people. And I think, uh, I, I say I'm not an expert, but I'm only, I only, I've had, you know, our four parents, my two parents and my husband's two parents, three went with dementia. So I have dealt with a lot of it in my time and it is the most awful um, disease. And I do sometimes think, I said to them, you know, shouldn't we just take all this money and put it into trying to find a cure? But it seems that we're so far away from a cure and unlike, you know, there's been so much progress in cancer and of course in finding cures for cancer and immunology for cancer, we're all going to live longer and get, so there will, I'm sure there'll be a cure eventually, but the argument is that we're going to have more and more of us and we, we need to help people to live in their homes. And it is about absolutely what you say is people get very confused. They can't hold those, the short-term memory goes, and they can't hold that information they need. Um, it's as much about helping the carers as about the dementia sufferers, I think. But the, if you read the challenge on the website, it's about the smart devices that will do that for them. So someone else might have to set it up, but the device would help, help you get your MIDI file. That's the idea, something like that. So it, it's not that the answer is the web. I mean, in a sense, this, this one isn't so much about my research. I have done work on augmenting human memory using um, uh, having life storage systems, you know, so you could store your memories. And there's a lot of work that shows, um, uh, you know, that uh, 
the life logging and what's the, mic, the thing Microsoft did, the camera, the taking pictures. The, um, the uh, you know, if, if you, uh, people take pictures of what they're doing all day and you replay those pictures in the evening, the carer does, then it helps stimulate the discussion and remem mem the memories of what happened that day. Um, but it, it's not just, it's, it's about trying to um, set, up, set up a system that in the house, you know, I mean, things like, you know, the stuff about leaving the oven on and, and all the, the <laughs> sort of putting the, putting the saucepan on, you know, things burn and all that problem, it's, isn't it? It's, um, and uh, uh, what was I going to say about that? Something. <laughs> oh, no. no. I can't remember. First sign of dementia setting in here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might be at that point in the evening where we desperately want to yes. listen to Wendy more, but actually the refreshments are calling. So there will, of course, be an opportunity to continue discussions with Wendy afterwards, but I'd like to invite uh, Professor Ursula Martin from the University of Oxford to give us a vote of thanks. Well. After that, after that terrific talk, a very thought-provoking talk, um, what can I say? I have 49 slides. My, no. <laughs> um, why did I bring the laptop up here? Well, actually, because you don't need me to give a vote of thanks, because people are out there tweeting um, their thanks. Um, all sorts of people tweeting pictures, which they've already taken, which are whizzing off. I don't do Twitter. Which are whizzing off wherever. Mehmet Kamaraglu, um, Emma Duke Williams, the BTS, tweeting pictures. John Crowcroft saying, um, wonderful talk by Dame Wendy Hall, straight speaking about what the UK did wrong for women in CS. So thank you, Wendy. Everybody, lots of people saying thank you. I'm saying thank you to um, a terrific talk. Please carry on thinking about the big challenges, the Longitude Prize, dementia, where the web is going, speaking out for women in computing, telling us where to spend our time, where not to spend our time. It's been a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you.